last week. Well, we finished up our series through Jonah a couple weeks back. And last week for Easter, we looked at the first part of John 20. I want to pick up there and consider the second part of the Gospel of John chapter 20, where Jesus appears to his disciples and then to Thomas and continue to think about the power of the resurrection in our lives. So, Gospel of John chapter 20, verse 19 on my Bible, it's page 906. You can find one of those, the black ESV Bibles there spread around. Here we go. I'll read then pray. On the evening of that day, this is the day of the resurrection, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. And he said to them, Unless I see his, in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, O oh Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would be with us now. Open our ears and our hearts that we might be counted among those who believe and so find life in the only name given, our Lord Jesus, who is the Son of God and Savior of sinners. Thank you that you have kept these words for us now over hundreds, thousands of years. These things written in this book so that we might believe. Oh, Holy Spirit, would you bring these words to life that they might have the effect you intended upon our hearts that we might be changed. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Ernest Hemingway in his novel, The Sun Also Rises, has one character ask another, how did you go bankrupt? To which the other character replies, gradually, then suddenly. Now that line is, I don't know if you, some of you may have heard that if you're in the finance and things, that, that line is often referenced because there's a, a ring of truth about it. A bankruptcy in real life does indeed happen gradually, and then suddenly, this pattern, pattern of gradually, then suddenly, also seems to me to apply to better things, to good things. And bankruptcy, of course. Instead of losing it all, what about gaining it all? Receiving that gift of faith. I don't know, as, as I think about my own testimony, as I hear other people talk about how they've come to Christ, often in hindsight, our experience of coming to believe in Jesus as the Christ, as the Son of God, 
is often the fruit of God working in our lives over time, gradually, and then there's a sudden realization that we do, in fact, belong to him. We think about Thomas and the other disciples. Here near the end of John's Gospel, we read the sudden and yet crystal clear confession of Thomas, my Lord and my God. As Jesus stands and speaks, ready for Thomas to touch his hands, to put his finger into his side, something new and sudden has happened for Thomas. Even though his faith has been growing gradually over the years, for several years, he's been walking with Jesus. Early in this very same Gospel of John, in just the second chapter, John recounts what he calls the first sign of Jesus. When Jesus turned water to wine at the wedding in Canaan, John wrote this, The first of his signs Jesus did at Canaan in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So this is interesting. At the very sort of beginning of his ministry, as Jesus does this wonder of turning water into wine, the disciples believe, or they see it, and believe. At least they believe that he can work wonders. Right? But there, there's more for them to believe. He does not yet believe Jesus was raised, raised from the dead until he can see him with his own eyes that he was in fact raised from the dead. And this makes sense because Jesus had to accomplish his work at the cross and the resurrection to rise from the dead before his disciples could actually take it in and see it and believe that it had happened. But now that it has happened, they believe. And they write and they preach that others might believe. That they might come to faith. And John tells us that's why these things are written down, so that they may be, might believe. But believing faith is not an end in itself. There's a purpose to it. Look at the very, let's go to the very end of this section before we really get started. But these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and, and that by believing you may have life in his name. All these things Jesus did are preached for a purpose that you might believe, that I might believe, that our, that our neighbors, all who are appointed to eternal life, might believe. These things are written for us, for you, so that you might believe, like Thomas did, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of sinners. This is the good news of the good news. Right here in these verses. Right, how people once lost and deadened by sin find life through believing. Isn't that good news? How do we find life? How do we come to Christ? By faith, by believing, not through working, not through striving. Not through earning, not through paying some price on our own, not through this penance, penance of like punishing ourselves, not through self-improvement or sheer luck, but simply through faith, trusting pers a person outside of ourselves, Jesus, what he did, depending on him. This is the good news of the gospel. We don't work our way into life, we receive it. As those who can find it in no other way but as a gift come to us from above. Do you see how this wonder offers incredible freedom for us? Our life is not built upon our performance. Our life is not built in keeping up with others. It's not lived, lived always found and always trying to like a, a greater high, right? Because this life is full of ups and downs, and backs and forths. 
Our life isn't dependent upon our successes or our failures, but the victory of Jesus Christ, proven in his resurrection. Which finally brings me to my, really, my first point I want to draw out of the text here. That a believer's life, if you put your faith in Christ, your life is founded upon, it's built upon a peace that has already been secured. A believer's life is founded upon a peace that has already been secured. Peace is more than a feeling. It is an objective reality secured for us by Christ, and we find it in Christ. Look at verse 19 where we began. On the evening of that first of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace. Peace be with you. The disciples had locked themselves in for fear of the Jews, and Jesus came. And this is the good news of the gospel. Jesus came. <laughs> they were hiding, they were afraid, they didn't have any strength. Or hope in themselves, Jesus came from the outside to them. Through the bars that locked the door, he stood among them. He was there, and what did he do? He spoke. And what did Jesus speak? He spoke peace. Peace. Peace be with you. Jesus comes and into our lives, he comes to us. And what does he speak? A word of condemnation? No. Peace. Peace be with you. The Prince of Peace grants them peace. Shalom. This biblical word, peace, means more than the absence of fear or conflict. It's more than a, an easy feeling. It means wholeness. Unqualified well being, reconciliation with God, reconciliation with others, reconciliation with ourselves, peace inside and out, a thorough going peace. D.A. Carson, great scholar and commentator, wrote Jesus Shalom on Easter evening, and that's where we are now, Easter evening. Jesus' word of peace on Easter evening is the complement of. It is finished on the cross. For the peace of reconciliation and life from God is now imparted. I love that it connects the cross and the resurrection. Jesus said, it is finished on the cross. And so out of his finished work, what was done there, he can now say, peace. It is well with you if you're trusting me. It is finished. Peace to you. Peace be with you. Peace is the outcome of the victory that Jesus won as he finished the atoning work on the cross. And he proves it. He shows them his hands. Look, verse 20. When he had said this, he showed them his hands. And his, side, and his side, and they were glad. And he said again, peace be with you. Their peace, that very evening. Our peace today, this morning, is objectively proven, guaranteed by those scars on Jesus' hands. A physical testimony to a spiritual reality, as you just saying, Jesus paid it all. Peace is now yours. It's proven. He suffered for sinners. By his wounds, you are healed. He endured the shame of a common criminal that we might know the peace and security of royal children, children of God's family. He was cut off and forsaken that we might be gathered in and set free for a new life that will never end. Peace. Be with you is proven, it's done, it's ours, it's this objective truth outside of ourselves. No matter how you're feeling about yourself today, no matter what kind of week you had, failures or successes, no matter what 
the popular opinion is about you and your house, no matter what those voices, those straw men, those committees and characters that you're worried about what people think, it doesn't matter. What matters is this. Jesus has finished the work. Jesus paid it all, and he has pronounced over you peace if you will receive that gift by faith. This peace can be yours. And it's a peace through and through. Peace with God. Peace with everything that all the trials and sorrows and what will happen in this life. Peace with the, in your own conscience because you know you're a sinner. You know you've hurt people. You know you've let people down. And Jesus comes and said, leave it behind. Peace. Enter into life and joy and freedom. Oh, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I'm like Thomas, come show me, Lord, help me. Come. This next verse 21 serves as a transition of sorts. Jesus again speaks peace over them and continues with a commission, a mission, sending them. Verse 21, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. This really comes to the second point I want to make. Abundant life, real life, is worked out in purposes greater than serving ourselves. Right? Jesus came and gave us peace, but not so that we could just sort of turn in on ourselves and kick back and have a, you know, whatever the Miller time life on the beach. Right? We have this peace and then are given the privilege of sharing that peace with others. And in fact, that's the life where we find life. When we begin thinking about others, we realize we are sent. We are gathered in for the purpose of being sent out to do good works, to carry on the mission of calling people to the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. There are yet souls that haven't yet been gathered in, and He might want to use us. He might want us to enjoy the thrill, the joy of seeing other people gathered in to this hope of peace. And so he sends his disciples, he sends us, but not on our own, not to do it in our own striving, with the gift of the Holy Spirit, the presence of Christ himself. Even as Jesus ascends bodily to the Father, he gives them, he breathes on them the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't really know how this day works with Pentecost and 50 days later from the resurrection. There's kind of this muddy area where Jesus is coming and going. He hasn't ascended. He seems to ascend his back and he ascends again. But what we know between here and Pentecost is this turning of history where we have the Spirit in more fullness than they did in the time of the Old Testament. And we have the Spirit to keep us until Jesus comes back. It's His very presence with us. So now we are not a people of the flesh, slaves to the flesh, slaves to sin. We are a people of the Spirit. You are, if you're trusting in Christ, you are a spirit person, a new creation. You've been gathered into this new thing God is doing, a new world that's coming. We are participating in a world that is, in a sense, not yet fully here, but it's coming. And for now, we're, we're living in the anticipation, the hope, and the sure confidence that Jesus is with us by His Spirit. The sharp point, the leading edge of the mission of the church is in the announcement spoken here. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold the forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. The church will do more than proclaim forgiveness, but it will never do less. <laughs> so we are, of course, called to the ministry of mercy and care for the poor and to seek justice, to love our neighbors. And yet there's a certain primacy, something that only we can do as the church, and that's to proclaim the gospel that has captured our hearts and minds, share the love of Christ that has made us new and brought us from fear to joy. That's what happens the disciples that night. They went from being afraid to glad in Christ. And so it is for us, right? We hear the gospel and we're brought from the fear of punishment, the fear of death, into the joy of knowing Christ. We have a Savior who will make a 
these live forever. Who will keep us from now and forevermore. Christ is mine forevermore. That's the good news. For the wages of sin, sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And have forgiveness. And so we are sent out with this message of forgiveness in Christ. I really have a few more minutes. Let me talk about one more thing. One, one final point. Just how we see in Jesus' return here to Thomas that God graciously meets us. And he gives us what we need to follow and serve him. We, our God is generous and good and kind. He'll give you what you need. So ask. Thomas needed a unique encounter with the risen Lord Jesus. For some reason, Thomas needed this. I think partly for our sake. So we could read about it. Many have called Thomas a doubter. And I, I don't think the point is for us to critique Thomas, Thomas's faith, but to consider our own. And Jesus at times would admonish those who demanded signs and wanted to see things. But he also just instructed his disciples to ask. Pray. If you want something, ask. Ask it in my name. And so Thomas, I think, in a sense, asks as he declares his reluctance to believe to the other disciples. And it's remarkable how Jesus repeats the very same words Thomas spoke back to him when he appears eight days later. It's almost the signal to Thomas, I heard you. I hear. Here I am. There's no indication that Thomas actually touched Jesus or had to put his hands in his side. As soon as he heard Jesus' words, his own words through Jesus' mouth, he declares, he confesses his faith, my Lord and my God. It's a beautiful moment. Thomas believes. Jesus was kind to him. In his unbelief. And so he is towards us. Our Jesus is ever patient, ever kind, drawing us closer to himself. Have you asked him to help you believe? When you're afraid, when you're doubting, when you're questioning, do you lift those things to the Lord? He is kind to answer. I read something this week. I thought it was really cool. Some of you actually, I think some of you have met Karen Swallow Pryor. She's spoken here locally. She's a Christian author and teacher. She wrote this week about a recent experience. Um, she was boarding an airplane, and she wrote about the fact that she was feeling what she described as an overwhelming sense of grief and, grief and loss. As she was getting on another airplane, there's some circumstances in her life, job changes and things that are happening, and she was just feeling tremendous grief and loss by her own testimony. And so she prayed a very pointed prayer. She asked the Lord to send an unexpected and pointed encouragement. Right? She's feeling grief and loss Lord, would you encourage me in a pointed way today? Do you ever pray like that? And for some people, I think that sounds too bold. Almost like we're asking for too much, like for something special from the Lord. But that's what she did. As she's being on the airplane, she sits down in the seat. A few minutes into the flight, 10, 15 minutes into the flight, she puts down the tray at her seat. And there is a note taped inside the tray. <laughs> And on the outside of the note, or printed in uh, handwriting, the words of Jeremiah 31.3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. With unfailing love, I have drawn you to myself. And on the inside of the note, just a beautiful note of encouragement. And she believes that the Spirit had prompted the person who sat in that seat before her to write this note which actually really fit her circumstances. And it was a note 
from the Lord to her through one of God's people. Karen's prayer was answered in a remarkable way, orchestrated by the Lord for her. It's a neat story. That's what I was thinking about. I was like, man, that'd be cool if you sent me a note, Lord. <laughs> and then I realized, he already has. <laughs> right. This note is for us. We can take the word of John and all the scriptures for ourselves in the same way. John tells us that here. These things are written for you. Don't count yourself out of that, you. That you might believe in the Lord Jesus and that you might find life in his name, the full life, the abundant life. This is a love note from heaven for you. In fact, I love hearing that Jesus speaks a word of blessing over you. Verse 29, Jesus said to Thomas, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That is a beatitude, one of two in the Gospel of John, a blessing spoken over every believer who came after his ascension to the Father, right? Who didn't get to see Jesus bodily. That includes you and me. If you are believing in Christ, if you're a Christian this morning, this blessing is for you. Jesus spoke this blessing over you. Blessed are you who have not seen and yet have believed. Will you receive it? Will you take it in? Jesus loves you. Jesus is speaking peace over you. Jesus is blessing you. It's a special note for you. In this passage, we see a compressed fulfillment of Jesus' promise to his disciples. He had said to them earlier in the week, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. That has happened for this, them all this evening. Their fear and their sorrow has turned to joy. I think the way the English ESV translates the end of verse 20 is like the understatement of the book. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. They were overjoyed, right? Surely. But I think the Greek it should be translated overjoyed. Right? We need to have superlatives here. When they realized Jesus was alive, they, they were overjoyed. Their sorrow turned to joy. It happened in a moment in that room. That promise that our sorrow will turn to joy is also sure for us. And it may not happen in the moment or in the evening. It may be worked out, over, most likely to be worked out over the whole course of the Christian life. It may not be till you cross the river, till you die and are raised in glory. That's when we'll experience the fullness of the joy. Right? But this promise will be fulfilled. Jesus said, your sorrow will return to joy. And we can hold on to that by faith. In the words of Peter, we are grieved with various trials now, and yet we cling to Jesus by faith. And in clinging to him, we find an inexpressible joy, a joy that doesn't make sense to the world, a joy that sustains us through all the valleys and trials. He keeps us, and he will raise us just as he was risen. Let me close with just another thought this week. It's been almost three weeks since the horrific events of Monday morning, March 27th, at the Covenant School in Nashville. I read an article on Friday by another pastor that lives down that way that just reminded me of the simplicity and power of the gospel at work in us, even in the worst things we face in this life. You know, the pastor, Chad Scruggs, lost a daughter that morning. And he gave a very short statement to the press later that I think captures well the reality of living in a fallen world and yet with resurrection hope. 
He said it very simply. We are heartbroken. She was such a blank. Through tears, we trust that she is in the arms of Jesus, who will raise her to life once again. That's it. That, that's the truth, isn't it? That's an honest hope. We live in a heartbreaking world. We hope through tears. And friends, there will be many more tears. <laughs> if we stick together for many more years, right? We, we'll, we'll need to have a cemetery maybe out there for you guys. Right? We'll there'll be many funerals and there'll be many, much suffering and many losses. There will be tears. And yet we hope and trust in real arms. I love the way Chad said that. We trust you. She's in the arms of Jesus. Real arms that have nail-scarred hands that even now are strong to save, to raise all who belong to him to new life, to live forever. We who grieve the sorrows of this life and we who grieve our own unbelief will one day be clothed anew with gladness. And we'll know the fullness of joy. This is the hope of the gospel. We will know the fullness of joy because Jesus came and he has spoken peace to all who receive him and put their hope in his name. Consider this an invitation to put all your hope in Christ, to believe on him, and to begin a new life, an abundant life, Center on him and his finished work at the cross and in his resurrection. Let's pray.